Hear the word of the Lord from Psalm 84 as we come and gather in worship this morning. The psalmist writes, How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty! My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may have her young, a place near your altar. Lord Almighty, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Let's pray together. Lord, as your word reminds us this morning, The presence of the Lord is a good and safe place. And as we gather together and worship this morning, we are deeply thankful for the Lord Jesus, who is our good and safe place. May we today more richly and more fully dwell in your love because of our Lord Jesus, by the power of his Spirit. Meet with us in this hour, we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, let me say welcome to you. It's great to see you here today. It has been our joy this week to have Reverend Sandy Wilson from Second Presbyterian Church in Memphis, Tennessee, as our Timothy series speaker It's been great to have him on campus, to hear from him in our Q&A times. We'll have another Q&A with him immediately following chapel today. It's good to have you here, to have your wife Allison and Mary here as well. We look forward to the word that you have for us today. Let's all stand together as we enter into a time of worship now. So life our ransom shed for us his precious blood who is not will not remember who can see to sing his praise if he can never be forgotten throughout death's eternal Your love is wider, 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 your love is
No love is deeper. No love is truer. No love is higher. No love is wider. No love is like you are love, Lord. Who is that? Will not remember. Can cease to sing his praise, but he can never be forgotten through our times, eternal days.
It's your breath in our lives. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lives. So we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lives. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. Lord Jesus, this morning, would you accept the sacrifice of our words, of our hearts, and our songs? We give you and you alone the praise and the glory. Amen. Please be seated. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of John, chapter 11, verses 1 through 44. Please turn there in your Bibles and follow along with me as I read. The book of John, chapter 11, verses 1 through 44. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus was now sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, The sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Then he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, A short while ago the Jews tried to stone you, And yet, you are going back there? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? A man who walks by day will not stumble, for he sees this world's light. It is when he walks by night that he stumbles, for he has no light. After he said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but the disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there, that you may believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas, called Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. And after she said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, They followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, 
she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. When the Jews, then the Jews said, see how he loved that him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man had kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man. By this time, there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. The word of the Lord. Well, it has been such a pleasure to be with you for uh, two or three days. And just uh, 20 minutes ago, when Anne introduced herself to me, I realized her father-in-law and I are good friends. And so we've just been discovering all kinds of connections my wife and I have while we're here. And, of course, when you spend time in a Christian community like this, a loving place, uh, what you discover is we are family, all of us. And those those family bonds have been really appreciated this week. Uh, on Tuesday, as Dr. Dockery and I were walking over here together, I said to him, don't you feel that when you're walking in the, the Welsh house and you walk over here to the chapel, you're on holy ground, you know, the place where Ken, cancer and, and um, Carl Henry have ministered and so many people now who will walk in their steps. And he said, indeed, I, I feel that way all the time. And I've certainly felt that way this week. Uh, it's a great honor to speak in a series called the Carl F.H. Henry Center for Theological Understanding series. Uh, Carl Henry uh, massively affected the 20th century and certainly still the 21st century and I think for centuries to come. I remember uh, one occasion, one of his professors, Dr. Gordon Clark, who in his old age happened to be one of my professors in apologetics in seminary. Uh, Dr. Clark uh, was Carl Henry's professor at Wheaton College. Uh, Dr. Clark went on to teach at Butler University and he ended his career at Covenant College in his senior years. And I was pastoring on Lookout Mountain, uh, Tennessee and Covenant College just down the road. And Gordon Clark in his senior years was able to convince Carl Henry to come down and give a series of talks at Covenant College. And let me tell you how he introduced him. Uh, Dr. Clark just stood at the lectern and he had librarians just bring in a bunch of books. There was a ta big table here. And one librarian after another just brought in books. Just a series of And Gordon Clark just stood there. Books. The whole table was filled with books. And here was Dr. Clark's introduction. The man who is to speak to us today wrote those books. <laughs> <laughs> I had a pastor friend there at the introduction. And he said, my, he's written more books than I think I've read. <laughs> So it is. And we all uh, walk in the steps and stand on the shoulders of such people. And we have to express our gratitude again today. Well, this week, we're looking at the theme assigned to us, the sting of death. And I've asked that we consider how we must, first of all, face our own death. Be sure that we've thought about it deeply and we have the gospel answer and that we're living it out consistently. Because as we minister to people who are facing death every day, uh, we must help them face their deaths with intuitive wisdom, which means we've really thought it through and we're really delighted to belong to the Lord. We have an answer for this 
deep problem. We studied that on Tuesday, and today I want us to talk more explicitly about how to face the death of other people. Just a little caveat before we look at the text for a few moments. I think it's important whenever we're in seminary, and in my opinion everywhere, that if we're Bible teachers and expositors, that we model how to expound the scriptures. And of course, I would like to do that for my brothers and sisters who are in seminary and who are uh, wrestling with ideas of how you want to preach and how you want to communicate the scriptures. And I firmly believe that we should expound the scriptures, which means that we follow the driving thought that's in the text and we follow it according to the way it's laid out for us, that we actually even outline our comments based on the outline of the argument or the narrative that's being presented to us. I think that's vitally important. You just can't do everything in a pulpit or from a lectern, and so you're better off really choosing one thing you're going to do. And it seems to me that if we are Bible teachers and Christian preachers, we ought to specialize on expounding the text and opening up the text as it's given to us by God's revelation. And so one caveat, normally it seems to me that in expository preaching we have to deal with and seek to discover what's the driving concern of the text and then we order our comments based on the text itself. In this case, we have gone to the text with a question, a previous question. Uh, normally the text should show us what the question is. So I may go to a text for a Sunday morning and I think I'm going to be talking about one thing or another and I get to the text and I discover, no, this text is really addressing another question. So in my expository ministry, that being the case, I'm going to change what I thought the topic was. Many times I've put a title on a sermon weeks ahead of time and by the time I get to Thursday of the week before the sermon, I realize my title was off. Well, so be it. Let the title go. We're going to deal with what the text says, but in these cases, Tuesday and today, we have intentionally gone to the text with a prior question. And I would say that the driving concern of the text in both cases, Tuesday and today, is not precisely the topic that we're addressing. So we're going to it much like a systematician would go to the text with a previous question. And it may not be the main point of the text, but the text is showing the systematic theologian, something about the topic he's researching, and it's legitimate, as long as we know what we're doing. I just wanted you to know, I think I know what I'm doing. <laughs> so <laughs> I want you to know what I'm doing. Uh, so in that sense, I, I don't think this is necessarily good uh, modeling for expository teaching, but hopefully as we go through the text and draw out of the text systematically what's there, maybe that would be helpful. Let me tell you about a friend of mine. His name is David Williams. He's a little older than myself, not an old, old enough to be my father, but old enough to be a young uncle or a really big brother. And I loved him dearly. He's a lawyer in Memphis. He was a lawyer until he died. And uh, he was one of those early attenders in my men's Bible study that started off with 30 or 40 people. And now for several years, we've had four or 500 people every Thursday morning at 630 in the morning for an hour, just straight exposition of text one week after another. And David was a faithful attender. And he had a great sense of humor, even as a lawyer. And he said to me one time, you know, I love the fact that our Bible studies at 6.30 because when I ask my non-Christian law partners to come with me, they can't tell me they're tied up. <laughs> he said, it's just wonderful. And he did bring his unbelieving partners to the Bible study. One day after the men's Bible study, he came up to me and he said, before you get away this morning, could I come to your office and talk with you for a moment. I said, sure, David. And he came and said, I just want to tell you, I've just been diagnosed with very serious cancer, and I, I think I probably have three or four months to live. And I, you know, I could hardly pick myself up off the floor. Here's this dear brother of mine, a friend of mine, and I knew nothing about this. And while I'm still stunned, he said to me, Sandy, I can't tell you how much I appreciate the men's Bible study uh, over these years, you've really taught me how to live like a Christian, and I'm, I'm deeply grateful. But he said, I need your help. I want you to teach me now how to die like a Christian. Well, I could hardly speak, but of course I had my assignment cut out for me. And it was an assignment for me. I want to learn how to die like a Christian. I mean, for one thing, I've got to help my friend David. And we, we worked on that project together. How does a 
how does a dying man die well? And it just seems to me that whether you're going into pastoral ministry or wherever you're going, if you have theological training, you have biblical training, I think the church has a right to expect from us that we've, we've dealt with some of these deep, ultimate questions, and we'd like to help people, uh, regardless of the particular Christian ministry that we undertake following graduation. So I'd like to look at this text, and well, well of course, with 44 verses uh, that Anne read beautifully, we're, we're going to just have to skim the surface because what I want to do is to pick out some principles. Once again, going to this as a systematician, we, we're going with a prior question. And the question is, how did Jesus do this? Now, certainly in John 11, the resounding theme is that here we're dealing with the seventh massive sign that's performed by our Lord Jesus Christ, showing us who he is as Messiah and Son of God. He does nothing less than raising a dead man after four days in the grave. Now there's the point of John 11 to be sure, but we're going to go to John 11 and say, how did Jesus deal with the people even as he was executing this glorious sign, this seventh sign in John chapter 11? The first thing I'd like for us to notice, and you get it in verses 1 through 6, is if we are to deal Christianly with the death of other people, we must look for the hand of God. When you're dealing with issues of life and death, you have to understand, if, if nowhere else you, you would grasp this, certainly in human life and death you grasp, but the Lord is the Lord of life and the Lord of death. He's in charge of it all. Not only is he in charge of it, but here in these six verses, you'll see that Jesus has a strategy. He intentionally delays going to his good friend Lazarus. And Lazarus is called his beloved friend here. Throughout this text, there's no question that these are very close friends of Jesus. He loved, everyone knew he loved Martha and he loved Mary. He loved their brother Lazarus. They were very good friends. And they sent word to Jesus, our brother is ill. We know you can do something. Would you please come and heal him? They had seen him heal other people. They knew he could do this. And Jesus, this is the strangest text, isn't it? Jesus seems to fiddle-faddle around. He seems to be in no hurry at all. As a matter of fact, he tells us that he's intentionally delaying going to them. And he tells us why. In verse 4, he says, it's for the glory of God. You, you, you're going to see the glory of God through this very painful experience. And ladies and gentlemen, for the people of God, I'm telling you, no matter how profound the pain is in this congregation, I'm aware that God is at work, and one day through this pain, he's going to display his unending glory in the resurrection of his people. And it's in this broken world and in our sinful flesh, the only way in which we can see this glory in our condition and the ethos in which we live is for suffering to have its way with us. And you see here that Jesus actually intentionally allows his best friends to suffer and die. Now, we would never, in the first thrush of someone's pain and grief, say to you, well, you know, Jesus did this to you. There's some things that people never grasp. There's some things they grasp a year after the episode of a beloved one's death, sometimes decades later. But in your mind and heart, as you're helping this person, one thing you must not lose is the knowledge that the Lord Jesus Christ is ruling over every moment, every affliction, every encounter. And this is a divine appointment for you to enter into someone's life. Jesus is at work. And he's going to display his glory. And he also says later, it's for the building of their faith. And so when you have a devastated orphan before you are, or a bereaved woman who's lost her best friend or husband, and you yourself seem almost overwhelmed. Don't lose sight of the fact that the Lord's at work here. The, the great physician is doing his work. And you may not know what, know what it is, but you have this secret in your heart. And you're, you're looking for the hand of God. And you're anticipating that he's going to take what is deeply sorrowful 
in your life and especially in the life of this dear family. And he's going to work his way gloriously with them ultimately. So that's the first thing you notice with Jesus. There's no rush. There's no wringing of the hands. There's no immediate relief of the sorrow or the fears. But there is an absolute control where he will display his glory and build the trust that his people have for him. Now, if you look at verses 7 through 16, you'll pick up, uh, I think, another very important point, and that is, very simply, Jesus goes to the bereaved. These are his good friends. He eventually goes to them. His disciples don't understand what he's doing. They don't understand why he's going. They know that he has great opposition. They're afraid he's going to get killed, and if they go, they'll get killed with him. Thomas just can't see beyond his own, his own skin. But Jesus is determined. And he's going to go. And sometimes, you know, I think especially if you're new into ministry, entering into the deep sorrows of people, and it makes you feel very uncomfortable. Look, I came from a a brief business background. I had an engineering degree undergraduate, and then I went into business. And I'll never forget my first internship in church. I was overwhelmed with the emotions that were being expressed in this environment. We didn't do that in my corporation. Uh, (laughs) And we wore three-piece suits and we, you know, we presented ourselves as everything's fine. We didn't go into detail about all these sorrows and afflictions and troubles and conflicts. I was just amazed at the level of emotion in pastoral ministry. Well, you may be too. And it takes a while to develop intuitions to be of, to be of help in that environment. But you must go and you must learn. And maybe in the Q&A time, I can tell you about my first hospital visit. It was a disaster. (laughs) So I'm sorry, but you'll probably have to go through this too. You just have to start. And you have to just go. Just go. You're not Jesus, but just go. Jesus is living in you. And sometimes people say, I just don't know what to say. Good. Just don't say much of anything. You know, Job's friends were great for three days. They kept their mouths shut. And as soon as they opened their mouths, they ruined everything. And I tell folks, if you'll just say, I'm so sorry. And you put a hand on the shoulder or you just, ladies, you, you know you, how you can just grab a sister and just envelop her. Just say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's amazing how therapeutic that is. And pastors must be the examples. Ministry leaders must Show the people how important it is to go to funerals. We're too busy for funerals today. Well, we're too busy for Jesus then, I suppose. Because when Jesus' friends were in sorrow, he went to them and he gave them his time. And he sat there just to, just to, to be with them. Of course, he did much more than that. And he does much more than that today. But we, we sometimes, we just go and sit and we hang around. Because we're there to be with them. That's exactly what we must do. Now, thirdly, as we move along, notice in verses 17 through 29, Jesus taught them the truth, and you've got to teach the truth. If you're a pastor, you especially must enter into this moment to teach the truth. Not necessarily all the truth you ever heard, not even necessarily all the truth that's relevant for that particular situation, because there are If you're in pastoral ministry, you have a long time to to deal with people and to work out the implications of the sorrow and the loss and the death. But you pick the right words for the right moment. You ask God to help you. And it begins with, I'm just so sorry. Is there anything I can do to help? And I'll be praying for you. Just real simple. But in the funeral, sometimes people will say, what do you say in a funeral? You know, uh, there's a letter that's being circulated now that uh, Justice Scalia wrote to a Presbyterian minister at the funeral of one of his fellow justices, and he thanked the minister because there was a lack of eulogy, and it was just talking about Christ and the resurrection, and Scalia was, was uh, commending the Presbyterian minister for this, and one of the young men on our staff sent that to me and said, shouldn't we maybe think about eliminating eulogies? Well, let me just say what I think you're trying to accomplish in, in a eulogy. First of all, you're praising God. He is the creator of all life. He is to be worshipped. And in a Christian funeral, remember, it is a worship service. 
there for all the music, all the readings, and all the comments, as far as you have anything to do with it, or to honor the Lord Jesus Christ. So if there's a funeral at Second Presbyterian Church and we're conducting it, we're therefore responsible for it, and we are the chief liturgist for it. If we're invited to speak at the funeral home at a service we're not conducting, fine, they can do as they will, and we'll take responsibility for the sermon. But if you're conducting something, you must take hold of it and be sure that it all glorifies God. He is the main one to be honored. Secondly, I do believe eulogies are appropriate for several reasons as part of the message. First of all, we're all creatures of God. And he has put good of some sort in every human being. We're made in his image. Good in the, you know, from not perfectly good. You know what I mean by good. He has put his image upon us. And if the person is a redeemed sinner then, of course, there are things we thank God for in that person's life as a result of regeneration and sanctification. And it's appropriate in our praise of God and thanks of, to him that we acknowledge what he's done in this human life. There's another reason for it, however. Remember, you have a mixed audience. Your first audience is the family. They usually sit right there. Your second audience is everyone else, and there are all kinds of people there. So in acknowledging sometimes humorous things, but things that were useful or helpful to this family and then in a minor way uh, that others would have benefited from, you're connecting them to your message. In other words, they're, they're acknowledging that what you're saying is true and you're, you're connecting with them. We all love the deceased or we wouldn't be here. So there's something we have in common. Now I'm going to present the gospel to you in a moment, but for the moment we can all talk about why we're here, whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian. So I think a modest eulogy that is in a thankful, grateful framework is appropriate. And I would suggest that you do that, but not make it your main part of the message. So first of all, praise God, thank him for the deceased and the things that we enjoyed about him or her. And then thirdly, move to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, when Ben Hayden, who was the senior minister at First Presbyterian Church in Chattanooga, was still living and still ministering, he's now deceased. But when he was in ministry at First Presbyterian, I would often tell people, if you're driving through Chattanooga, Tennessee during the day, stop at somewhere and get the Chattanooga Times and see if there's a funeral at First Presbyterian Church. It's a large church, so you might, you know, you might hit it. There might be a funeral. I don't care who the deceased is, whether you knew them or not. If there's a funeral, go to the funeral. Hope that Ben Hayden is preaching it. And you will hear the gospel like you've never heard it before. And this is what Ben did. We praise and thank God. We acknowledge why we love this person. And then in the case that it was a Christian person, he would say, now let me tell you what was at the very heart of this man's life. And he preached the gospel. Told them all about Jesus. He had the Qantas Club over here and the Rotary Club over here and all the people in downtown Chattanooga. Wonderful way to minister the gospel. Don't miss it. Now, sometimes folks will say, well, what do you do if it's, if it's an unbeliever? Well, you're not without words. Think about it. We praise God. We thank God for the things in the deceased that were appreciated by the people here. And then we don't talk about the resurrection about this person, we're, we don't say we're going to see him again because if you say that, you might be saying something you don't wish to say. Maybe you will see him again, but it won't be very pleasant. You know, one time a, a man came to the pastor and said, look, I know my brother went, never went to church and he was kind of a rascal, but at his funeral, I want you to say nothing but good things about him. I mean, I want you to say that he was a saint. And the pastor said, well, I don't know. And the man said, well, I want to make a $1 million donation to your church. The pastor said, well, maybe we can work something out. <laughs> so they get to the funeral, and the pastor says, Joe here who died, he, he was a scoundrel. He cheated on his wife multiple times. He ripped you all off of all kinds of money. He rarely came to church. But compared to his brother, he was a saint. <laughs> uh, here, here's my point. You, you've got to tell the truth. I've seen ministers, out of alleged sympathy for the family, stretch what 
any credible person would say was the truth about the person's life. And what you do when you do that is to dilute the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you must not do that. Ben Hayden often said that he would much rather preach at a funeral than a wedding. And you can understand why. From a preacher's point of view, the wedding, people are all excited and uh, everything's going on. Nobody's listening to a word you're saying. In a funeral, you have everybody's attention. Christian and non-Christian alike, what's that man going to say in a moment like this? And you need to be prepared to say it. And you need to tell the truth. Don't dilute the gospel. It's more important than any relationship you have with anybody on this planet, including the deceased member's family. So you don't lie. But you say to the people who are there, I've, you know, I've had all kinds of funerals, suicides, unbelievers, and I tell them how the Lord would not break a bruised reed or snuff out a smoking flax, how anyone who's weary and wounded can come to him. He receives all of us in the midst of our deep sorrows, and sometimes, yes, the God of the Bible makes it clear he'll even use our sorrows to draw him to himself. He loves us that much. And he's saying that through this preacher to you today, that even through this terrible and tragic loss, that there's a God who will comfort you if you'll come to him. So you, you have words to say. They're gospel words, but be sure they're true. Jesus teaches. And he says to Martha and Mary, your brother will rise again. Those are true words. They, they can't believe it. They've never seen this happen before. Who's ever seen a dead man rise after four days? Martha and Mary hadn't. But Jesus says it, whether they understand it or not. And they, they, they say, well, Martha said, well, I know, you know, the, the end of the day, there'll be a re Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And he says, I am the way in which someone does rise. And so those are the true words he teaches. Be a teacher with a heart of compassion, which leads us to the next point. You'll notice in verses 30 through 37, fourthly, we must give our hearts. We're told here that Jesus was deeply troubled. The, the, the word here for deeply moved in verse 38 is a word that's used for the snorting of a racehorse. So some scholars say he deeply moved, but he was actually deeply moved with anger and restlessness. Angry at the devastation of death around him. Restless to see the solution to it. Troubled in his soul. And ladies and gentlemen, I don't know how we can face the death of other people without entering into their sorrows. And entering into the hatred of sin and death. And finding ourselves calling out to God for his mercy for these people and for ourselves. You have to enter into it. I'll never forget a on occasion, when I was a younger minister, a retired minister came up to me. And he said, Sandy, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but it just, the Lord put it on my heart to share it with you. I knew why later. He didn't know why. But he said, I just lost my wife this past year. I'm 75 years old. And he said, you know, I look back through the years, these 40 years and more, of all the funerals I've performed and the heartless way in which I did it, the blithe way in which I spoke, the promises that were just thrown out with no sympathy in my heart for the folks. He said, of course, I was trying to put on the outward appearance of a compassionate pastor, but I know I didn't enter into their sorrows. And he said, now I've experienced it. He said, how oh, I wish I could go back. You know, obviously, I remember those words, and I, I took it as a word from the Lord. That's, he was speaking to me. I needed to hear that. And I told you the other day, we've had 750 funerals, and you say, well, don't you just get worn out? Yes, yeah, sometimes you do, but you, it never gets old. And the pain never goes away, and you don't want it to. Now, it's important that we realize that we're not there to let everybody know how grieved we are. So you have to get a hold of yourself. And I do think it's important that it, while you express sympathy and you enter in, you don't become a blathering idiot who's just overwhelmed for two reasons. Number one, it's not about you and how sorry you are. 
Congregation doesn't need to know that you all used to play in the sandbox together or that this was your best friend ever or any of that. It's not about you or how grieved you are. Even though you are. And you must be. And secondly, you've got a triumphant message to deliver. And we are not overwhelmed. We're Christians. Which leads us to the last point. When you get to verses 38 through 44, we learn that we've got to proclaim the victory. And ladies and gentlemen, above all, do not leave this bereaved widow and these forlorn children, orphans, without the message of the triumph of the resurrection. Now, I understand in private discourse, if I come on too heavily with that initially, it may seem trite. I, I, I don't mean that it is trite. I mean that it may be received as trite by someone who's in the midst of their sorrow. And what they really need from me is, I'm so sorry. But there is that moment, and particularly if you're preaching the funeral, that's the moment for sure. When not only this bereaved family, but everyone who's joined to share in their sorrows is to hear the triumph song of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not withhold this triumphant message. I love how William Howe put it in his multiple stanza hymn. He says, And when the fight is fierce, the warfare long, steals on the ear the distant triumph song, and hearts are brave again, and arms are strong. Below there breaks a yet more glorious day. The saints triumphant rise in bright array. The king of glory passes on his way. Alleluia, alleluia. From earth's wide bounds, from ocean's farthest coast, through gates of pearl, streams in the countless host, singing to Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Alleluia, alleluia. So I say to our organist, the recessional and the postlude is triumphant. For those of you who know organs, you'll understand triumphant under expression that is you close the shutters it's under expression but the organ is deeply moved it's snorting like a racehorse to say yes we weep now but joy comes in the morning and you can feel the organist ready to bust out he can hardly hold himself back but out of respect for those who are still in tearful sorrow we're identifying with your sorrows but we've got a message that is transcending the deepest of human sorrows now this is this is the role of the messenger and you mustn't withhold it unless there are no evidences that the person ever knew Jesus. And then you must not make a false promise. I'll close with this. My friend David Williams. We were in Jerusalem. We were in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. The line was long to get into the tomb of Jesus. So I waited outside and allowed the others to go forward. And finally, David and some others got in to see the tomb. And in a few moments, he came out. And he walked up to me. And he said, Pastor, I, I noticed something about this tomb. I said, David, what's that? He said, it's empty. <laughs> Lord, we, we thank you for the empty tomb. We thank you that one day our Bodies that have turned into dust will be reconstituted as glorious resurrection bodies. May our ministries, all of our days, all of our years, all of our messages ring with that distant triumph song. And may those who face the grief and sorrow of death and all of its misery be able to hear that song from our voices and see it in our lives. And may triumph reign in your church as we wait for our triumphant Savior to appear in all of his glory. And we shall see him as he is, for we shall be like him as well. It is with thanksgiving that we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Reverend Wilson, what a gift he has been for us this week to welcome you to our campus. Thank you for your exhortation, your guidance, your wisdom, and for being an example to us all of a minister who has faced his own death, who has helped others face their death, and who has faithfully proclaimed the good news of the gospel through it all. We are so thankful for your time, your ministry, and your proclamation of God's word in our midst this week. May the Lord bless you, bless you richly. May I also invite all of us to join us in Hinkson Hall for a time of Q&A with Reverend Wilson. And at this time, would you please stand for today's benediction. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.